Yeah, I'm going to be talking about a week that we spent over the summer um, with an archaeological investigation at the Weems Caves, um, which we also ran alongside public lectures and uh, an open day for, for, for visitors. Um, and the first thing to say is it's a lot more fun working inside a cave than it is working up on East Lomond. Um, <laughs> There's really five separate investigations that we made, um, and they've all got sort of different characters and different purposes. Um, so this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind through um, through the various investigations that we that we made. Um, for those that don't know the site, it's um, about nine ten miles um, from here along the uh, along the south coast. It's about a, a kilometre, which contains a number of caves. Uh, many of which contain a unique collection of Pictish carvings, um, and sitting above them is a castle that's first recorded in the 11th century. And to put the rarity of the carvings there in context, there are only eight caves in Scotland which contain Pictish carvings, uh, and five of those are at Weems. And of the 60 or so documented examples of surviving carvings in, in uh, Pictish carvings in caves, we've got 49 of them. So it really is a real concentration, a unique site in terms of the study of um, uh, the Pictish uh, symbols within, within caves. Um, so this is the site. It's a, a, a 3D model that we made using drone photography and forms the basis of our 4D Weems uh, Caves website. So if anybody wants to go and look at that, 4dweemscaves.org, you'll be able to see everything that we, we knew up until these excavations uh, about the caves. So. Um, these are, this is an illustration. I don't know why I chose J, James Drummond's illustrations, because he was a terrible artist, um, but it gathers them together nicely. So these, these are some of the surviving carvings that we still have. Uh, but alongside the surviving carvings, these are from 1866, these, these images. Um, there are also carvings that we've lost. So none of these can, are still visible. These were lost due to uh, cave collapse in the, um, in the early 20th century. And geological instability and collapse aren't the only problems on the site. You can see from the model here the extent of coastal erosion that we have all the way all the, uh, all, all the way along this this section of coast, um, and as well as natural elements, we also have the human intervention. This is a car that was driven into uh, Jonathan's cave about 30 years ago, set on fire, um, and we lost the. Um, I've watched people failing to do this all day, so I'm not even going to try. Um, there's a panel of uh, swans and Pictish beasts, which was uh, completely lost as a result of that, that vandalism. And uh, a couple of years ago, we, this is the sort of visitation that we get. This is modern graffiti, which is covering um, over a couple of early Christian crosses, because as well as the Christian, uh, as well as the Pictish carvings on the site, we've got a collection of um, early, early Christian crosses. Um, so when we came to investigate the, 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 the site, and I should say SWACs were founded as a result of that car being set on fire, um, and very much part of our mission is uh, not just to study the site, not just to uh, promote it, but actually protect it. And so all these things sort of come together and inform what we, what we do as an organisation. Um, and our strategy really is that the best way we can protect the site is to get more eyes on it, to get more people there, to get, get it better known, to get more visitors, and actually make it somewhere that involves the local community. It's very, most people in the area are extremely proud of, of, of what they have, and so the more we can, we can promote it, that's actually the best way to, to, to project it. So when it came to the drawing up project plan for what we were going to do, that idea of combining, uh, learning more about the site um, crucially, we, we weren't just learning more to know more about the site, it was about informing the management of it as well. What can we do to, to better protect it and, 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 and raise awareness of it? Um, so that was really very much what formed the, uh, the, the, the project design, which was put together. Um, SCAPE have already been mentioned in the context of East Lothian. Joanne Hambly from SCAPE, who also sits on our management committee, put, put forward the, uh, developed this project design. Um, so I'll start, uh, I'll just go. Uh, west east along the coast and start off with Court Cave. Um, court Cave uh, gets its name from uh, a medieval court uh, that was said to be held inside. We also know it's had numerous different uses um, throughout, the, the, throughout it, the, 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 its documented use. It's been used as a place for storing fishing nets, for repairing boats. It's, it's got a long, long history. 
Um, and as a result of that, we didn't really expect to find much inside it. And in fact, uh, we actually hoped we wouldn't find much inside it because one of the aims here, uh, and, and it, you can see it there, is to inform potential access improvement works. We want to put a path in um, so that people with restricted mobility, wheelchair users, etc., can actually get in and see the carvings inside for the, for the, first, um, for the first time. Um, and that plan follows on from works that we've been do done this summer um, using money we got from the Coalfields Regeneration Trust, where we've put in a new interpretation board, we've put in a picnic table outside. That's one of three that's going to go on the site. Uh, you can see it's got extended edges to allow wheelchair access underneath. And we really wanted to put in a spur from the five coastal path into, into the cave um, and, uh, as an accessible path. And to do that, we needed to establish the, uh, the depth and likelihood of any disturbance to, to, to archae surviving archaeology. Um, now, the, uh, if you read the antiquarian accounts of uh, investigating the caves, uh, it, it sort of makes you want to cry because they talk about, uh, uh, I instructed my men to clear out the caves and all they found was some old bone and pots. And we know nothing about the old bone and pots, um, apart from the fact that it was, it, it was there. Um, but given the range of historical use, we didn't really expect to, to, to find much inside. Um, and surprise, surprise, we didn't find very much inside. Um, what we did find, interestingly, uh, I don't know if you can see this layer of black that's running uh, through the middle of here. The bedrock is actually only a few inches below the surface. So the surface, as it is there now, is really uh, 20th century deposits um, uh, in wash and, and, and so on. But the layer of black was interesting, and the reason for that is these guys. Uh, this is miners in the 1930s. It was a very heavily uh, coal mining area, um, and Cork Cave became an unofficial meeting place for the miners. Particularly, it's where they went to do their illegal gambling, and they would play a game called Toss. Um, the, the, there's two types of games that miners play, gambled on, one called Pitch, one called Toss, and it just basically involves throwing coins and betting on which way they're, they're, they're going to go. And the black layer um, just below the surface is what we called the, uh, we, we called it the gambling layer because it's uh, formed from the coal dust on their boots as they go in uh, on their way and from, from work. So we've actually got archaeological evidence of them, them uh, playing, this, playing this game. In terms of our finds inside, we did actually find some things that had escaped the, uh, the, the various clearances. So this is some fragments of pot, uh, which Derek Hall identified for us as five sherds of Yorkshire ware, possibly 13th, 14th century, alongside a single um, body sherd of uh, Scottish white gritty ware from 14th, uh, 15th century. Uh, but that was all we found inside. Outside, um, well, we uh, got a bit of a surprise uh, and a bit of a bonanza. Um, uh, relative to what we found inside, um, because when the caves had been cleared out in medieval times or later, this is actually where all the debris ended up. And what we found was um, all sorts of uh, deposits uh, all mixed up within a, 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 so out of context, and so very difficult to, to tell exactly what was going on. But you can see from our volunteers, Chris and Janie in there, how deep we had to go to, to, to find this. So what we found basically in the cave, uh, nothing in the cave, to be disturbed and any path that goes through outside the cave is going to be well above any surviving archaeological layer. So hopefully that means that we can put in, put in the path that we, um, that we want to. But, so what we found inside there was a, a, an amount of bone. Uh, this has been identified by Catherine Smith as mostly cattle, um, some sheep, some goat, and a small amount of pig and horse. And the size of these bones is compatible with sort of pre-modern animals. So this is before agricultural improvements, uh, indicating that they are of a, a, of a medieval date or earlier. It also included wild species, so roe deer, hare, uh, otter, seal. Um, and so, uh, it, it, you know, it's not a very large assemblage, so we should be wary of interpret, you know, drawing too many conclusions about how representative that is of the sort of domestication that was taking place. Um, but it is similar to the same sort of domestic, the domestic species are similar to what's been recovered from middens and excavations in the 1980s and 1990s. So we, I think we'd be fairly sure that those sort of domestic animals formed part of the, the food chain. Um, and the wild species, as well as being eaten, would have been exploited uh, not only for food, but also the antlers, fur, oil, and, 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 and so on. So there's quite a wide range of activity going on there. Um, interestingly, no fish. So, um, going back to one of the earlier presentations. 
We also recovered uh, some pottery. These are sherds of a green glazed jug, uh, which Derek couldn't um, relate to any known Scottish fag brick, and so it's probably likely to be an English import dating from around the 14th or, or 15th century. Why we should only really have English pottery here is uh, a, a bit of a mystery uh, and something that we, do, we, we, we might want to look at later. Um, quite excitingly, we also recovered quite a lot of metal working residues from, from this pit. Uh, these were analysed by Gemma Cruikshank. Um, it's uh, predominantly ironworking slag, uh, which is difficult to date um, because ironworking techniques didn't really change that much uh, between the Iron Age and the medieval period. Um, the fact that it's recovered alongside the medieval pottery suggests it's, it's likely to be from that date, but Gemma certainly didn't rule out the possibility that it's earlier and dates back into the uh, early medieval period given the mixed nature of the, of the deposits. Uh, and in fact, any comparators from caves elsewhere in Scotland, all the metalworking has proved to be of Iron Age, uh, uh, Iron Age date. So um, we're hopeful we can actually get a date from this. Uh, I'm not sure this will work. There we go. Uh, because of this, this is a fragment of Tuyere. Uh, Tuyere being the, uh, uh, the, the sort of ceramic um, um, disc or tube uh, which protects the nozzle of uh, the bellows to, from the heat of, a, heat of a furnace. So it's clear evidence of uh, furnace um, high temperature metal working going on on the date, on the site. Uh, the reason we created this highly detailed uh, photogrammetric model is that if we are going to get a date from this, uh, it's going to be from thermoluminescence, which means we're actually going to have to destroy this in order to, to date it. Uh, and I think we're minded to do that because actually getting a date from this stuff is, is really quite, quite significant. Uh, but we're still discussing it. Um, but in the meantime, this is probably the most detailed, documented piece of six centimetres of Tuyer ever recovered. Um, theoretically, we could actually 3D print this again. Um, right, moving along the coast. Du Cave is the next, coast, uh, next cave along. Um, now, we know ex absolutely nothing, really, about the activities in Du Cave beyond its use as a uh, duca in the later medieval, uh, later medieval period. Um, this is it in a 19th century photograph where the wall outside is still intact. I don't know how clearly you can see that uh, with the holes at the top for the birds to, to, to fly in and fly in and out of. Um, and inside we have a whole series of niches for the, for the birds to nest in. Now, ducats in caves are not unusual. We know that other caves on the site were used uh, as, as ducats. Um, but what is unusual is the fact that we've got these niches carved into the walls. Um, other known examples are actually have built up structures with, against the cave walls, uh, you know, built up out of, out of stone. Uh, the only other example, and there's still caves fitted out like that underneath Weems Castle, uh, a mile or two along the coast. Uh, the only other example that we know of, um, of a rock cut, do cut like this, is in Midlothian, underneath Hawthorne Den um, Castle. Um, but that's actually a completely created artificial uh, rock cut chamber and their niches are perfectly regular and well-spaced. Um, whereas ours are all a little bit higgledy-piggledy, and we've also got these strange long ones. You can't really see them that well in this photograph, but as well as the individual niches, we've also got some quite, quite, quite long ones. Um, and everybody that's come to see the Du Cave, who knows anything about Ducats, has said two things. One is that you don't have long um, things because they don't like nesting next to each other. You have individual uh, niches for them and you also don't have them down at floor level because they're susceptible to rats and, and foxes and so on. So that's the, you know, odd, odd features. Um, other unusual things about the cave, uh, you can't see it very clearly in here but the roof has been deliberately shaped and right in the middle of that is North Berwick Law. Um, you, uh, you can see it much better on site than you, you can in the image. So is that coincidental or are they deliberately rep uh, respecting a, a landscape feature and actually framing it? And people take, a, this is like an iconic image of the case, people take this photograph to, to show, show North, North Berwick law. So unusual features. Um, this is a sketch from Romilly Allen in 1890. Um, and do Cave, as we know it now, is just the small section on the bottom right as you look at the picture. Um, and there are no Pictish carvings in it. The cave on the left, the much larger space, is actually absolutely covered in Pictish carvings. Uh, I'm going to say is, was, because uh, in the First World War, a coastal gun was placed on top of Du Cave. Uh, it was fired, and you can guess the rest. Down came the roof, and, and those, have been, uh, those have been lost. So 
why have we got Pictish carvings in one and nothing and none in the other? Um, really, we wanted to, to see whether we could find out was this actually a ducat originally, or maybe it actually predates its use as a ducat and has a, had another purpose. And at this point, I'm going to forget that I'm in a conference with archaeologists who demand evidence and things, and, and just invite you to imagine what other possible use, what else you might have fitted in those niches, long ones and square ones. Um, and there's been speculation uh, that perhaps it might have been a, a, an ossuary or, 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 or something. Entirely speculative. But anyway, I shall leave that there and not say any more. Um, anyway, we dug it. Um, this is Hannah and Kirsty uh, alongside Joe and Tom from SCAPE. Um, Hannah and Kirsty, a couple of our vol younger volunteers. Um, and the first thing we discovered was there are actually more rows than you can see now. Eventually, we found two layers of rows that had never been previously ex exposed. Um, we were quite excited at some point to find something that might have been a stirrup. But as we went further and further down, that became clear that actually everything in there was 20th century. And the corrugated iron at the bottom really gave the game away. <laughs> um, so everything in there is 20th century debris or inwash and post-dates the collapse of the cave next door. So it's basically all come through from, from, from the west the West Duke cave. But when we cleared all that away, we had a, a real surprise. Because not only we've we got niches in the walls, we've got them in the floor. Now, no pigeon's going to nest in the floor. So what, what are these doing here? What are they? Um, and what you can't see in this picture is that it seems to, there's an edge of what seems to be a rock-cut basin uh, next to these, the, these niches in, in the floor. So what on earth are they? Um, could they be beam slots, for example? Um, could they be the base for, 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 for built structure within inside the cave? The answer is uh, we just don't know. So we started off in the Dew Cave with unusual features, not knowing really anything about its use, and we ended up not really knowing anything about its use, but with more unusual features. Uh, so we're going to hopefully be going back in there to find out, do these, beam, do these slots in the bottom match up with anything else? Can we find more evidence um, of what they were used for? The next place we looked at is uh, around the castle. The castle, as I said, dates back to uh, at least the 11th century, the stone working surviving from the 13th century. We didn't look inside the scheduled area of the castle because what we really wanted to see was, was there any evidence of, of an earlier fort on the side, particularly an early medieval fort that might be contemporary with the, the Pictish carvings. Um, now, as our inspiration for that, we looked at what had been done at Dunicare in Angus. This is uh, Gordon Noble's work on Dunicare Promontory Fort, we wondered whether actually we've got a nice promontory sitting next to the castle. Could it possibly have been used, used in, the, in the same sort of way? Particularly because the style of the carvings recovered from Dunicare and um, are very similar to, to those, at, those at Weems. So could this be a sort of similar, similar use? Um, this is our 3D model of uh, the promontory, and in order to investigate it, we had to actually clear it. For the first time in many, many years, we cleared the landscape. And it's really interesting how since we've done that, there is a really clear, people have been using it. People use it now as a, as a, as a place to go and look out, uh, which they never did before. So our idea, of, uh, as, as part of the, um, the investigations, using it to bring more people into the site has certainly, has, has certainly worked. Um, we dug um, a series of test pits, um, a metre cubed, um, along the, it's 60 metres long, so we dug them every five metres, and um, this is us digging, and an, exa an example of a typical pit, and the, uh, the answer to, was there a early medieval fort on the site, every single pit looked like that, and absolutely nothing came out of them. So I think we can fairly or confidently say that if there is an early medieval fort on the site, then we're looking in the in the, the completely the wrong place. Um, this is the biggest find. It's a 1970s sandwich maker, uh, <laughs> a sandwich toaster, um, which um, I think, you know, John's looking extremely proud of that because it's really just about the only thing we found there. Um, apart from this, which popped out the very last pit at the end, this is an 1887 uh, um, half penny, and it's been deliberately cut. It's been deliberately, not quite in half, but it's been deliberately cut through. So what is that about? We had a bit of a puzzle about it and um, came up with this reference to, ooh, this reference to um, split coins where when 
uh, somebody would go away to war or um, perhaps go off to work somewhere, they'd cut a coin in half and leave one half with one person and, uh, and the other one would take it. So why have we only got one? What's happened to this half is, is a quite a nice story and we're looking about to working with local schools, perhaps a short story competition, explain why this is here. Was it somebody sailed away to war and as soon as he was over the horizon, she just threw the <laughs> half into the, in, into the ground. What, what's, what's the story there? But it's, working on the promontory is extremely interesting because we learned a lot about, even though we didn't find anything, we learned a lot about the social history and use of the site in the 20th century. The number of people who came up and told us how they played there as kids, how they picnicked there and so on was really, really uh, interesting and actually, you know, cemented what we were doing with the local community really quite well. So even though we didn't find anything, it was an extremely useful thing to do. Um, we did a bit of geophysics. You can see that blank area next to the castle. Um, interestingly, they don't bury bodies there because it's supposedly too wet. Uh, so we thought maybe there's a, a, a ditch or something in there. Maybe there's a moat. Um, so we got geophysics done. This is our friends from Edinburgh Archaeological Field Society doing it. And these are the results. The promontory, absolutely nothing. I can't read geophysics. It's all blobs to me. Um, almost certainly there is nothing in, in there, although uh, it has been suggested there's a possibility of a moat coming round just in front of the, of the castle. So that gives us another target to, to, to go back and look at, but generally inconclusive. The final site that we looked at is Sliding Cave. Um, now, the issue here um, isn't really about encouraging people into this area. In fact, we don't want them in Sliding Cave. Uh, we don't want them in there because it's the best it's the only place really on the site where there is intact surviving archaeology dating back to the early medieval uh, medieval period. Um, it's also significant, though, because um, as well as being archaeologically significant, it's the one in which the cave floor level is closest to the high water mark at, at spring tide. So it's the most vulnerable from, from, from flooding. And if the bank in front of it is breached, uh, it could cause significant damage to the, to the archaeological layers in there. It was previously investigated by um, oh, yeah. Previously investigated by Time Team, so there's Phil Harding and friends, Tony Robinson, etc., on their knees inside uh, Sliding Cave. During their investigations, they recovered some dating evidence from in there um, from uh, a trampled surface overlying what they identified as being a paved floor layer, and those dates were were from grain, and they came back and gave a third. To four, a single date, so he came back and gave a third to fourth century date. Very interesting indeed. Um, very early for Pictish carvings. Um, and this is right underneath where, where, where there are some Pictish carvings. And it's long been thought to be anomalously early, really. Um, until the work that uh, had been done at the University of Aberdeen by the, the Northern Picts project, uh, I mentioned Dunnicare earlier and the similarities. Uh, to, to, to some of the carvings that we have at Weems and the date, their dates are from as early as the third century as well. So th this was an important target for us and uh, Gordon Noble himself came down to, 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 take, to, to do these excavations with us. So it's a joint excavation between us and Aberdeen University. Um, and we wanted really to revisit the time team trenches and extend them and try and refine some of the dating or confirm them um, if possible. So this is, um, these, these are two serpent carvings which were uncovered by time team and then covered up again um, and we put in trench one right below there to see um, if we could find any more any more dating evidence um, and we put in another trench uh, beneath some other you can see the pictish carvings the sort of rectangle symbols in there um, we put in another trench there to see uh, see what we could get out, out of there in trench one we recovered um, animal bone, with limpets, uh, periwinkle shells from the same layer from which Time Team got, got their dates. So we've got more dating evidence now um, from the Time Team layer. Unfortunately, I, although I'd love to be able to announce to you that we've confirmed those Time Team dates, uh, they're still in uh, post excavation uh, and we probably won't get those until, uh, until next year, possibly as late, uh, not until the spring. So we can't, I, I can't actually announce to you in a blaze of glory that we've con confirmed those, that confirmed third, fourth century, century dates. Um, we did manage to establish that Time Team's paved layer is no such thing. It's actually in-washed boulders from a previous storm event or possibly from roof collapse. 
Um, so it's not a paved surface layer. But between the pockets of those boulders, we managed to go down deeper and recovered uh, an earlier occupation horizon from which we've got uh, more animal bone and charcoal. So again, we can do more dating to establish the sequence of occupation in, um, in Sliding Cave. Um, Trench 2 had similar stratigraphy, um, although it's quite a lot shallower because it's further from the cave mouth where there's a lot of inwash. Um, and and um, again, we recovered bone with uh, we, there's charcoal inclusions in there. And we also uncovered a, a shell rich midden um, from, from that layer as well. So this is all from the same layer as, 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 as Time Team. Um, the boulder deposits here were much more solid, concreted together, and to get through those and look for an earlier occupation layer would require really heavy rock breaking equipment and the sort of and, and a much bigger trench that we that we weren't able to do on this time. But again, it allowed means that something we can go back into there uh, again at a future date and, and have a look at. Um, so one final point on these deposits is they're actually although I mentioned about the antiquarians clearing out the caves. Um, they are similar to deposits that were noted in the other caves by James Young Simpson when he visited in 1866 and by Christian McLagan uh, when she was there in 1876. Both talked about the same sort of assemblages that, 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 that we've got, um, but they talked about them in other caves. So it does suggest that all the caves along that coast were being used in the same sort of way right back into the, uh, into the um, uh, probably the early medieval period and possibly earlier. Um, and that if they hadn't cleared them out and, uh, and thrown them away, we'd actually have much more evidence of occupation in there. So that's the, that's the archaeology. Um, during the course of the archaeology, uh, it's not really a site that's suitable for community engagement in the sense that you can't have school kids working in the caves. It, it's cramped, it's too, too difficult. We did engage local community where possible. We had about 30 uh, local volunteers over the course of the week taking part in these excavations. Um, so I want to sort of finish uh, to come back round to the to the other aim, which was the, the you know promotion of the caves and the management of the site. Um, during the dig, we held um, an open day, which included pictures, face painting, and that attracted a lot of young fam families with children. Um, so it was very successful from from that point of view. Uh, John Borland is lurking in one of those tents, uh, giving uh, pictures stone carving workshop. Um, and all in all, that day was attended by well over 200 people. Uh, we'd only planned to give three tours after the excavations on site and ended up giving nine. Such was the, uh, the scale of the interest. And that's on top of the 80 or so people that came to the public lectures given by Gordon Noble and, and, and Joanna Hambly. So in terms of raising the profile, uh, and it's interesting that those lectures, although, you know, they're, they're about the... the, the um, Pictish archaeology in, 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 in general um, were really well attended, not just by people interested in the pits, but by people from the very, very local community, you know, people from the housing estate where, they, where, where we held the, the meeting and so on. So in terms of sort of the, the site and the caves belonging to local people and generating interest, and really that's the best way to protect them for the future, is getting those young people along, getting the community involved. The more local pairs of eyes that there are on the site, the better we can, we can look after them in, in, uh, in, in the future. That was very, very um, successful. As well as whilst the excavations were taking place, a stream of people coming through, giving us their stories, telling us about the local history and so on. So from, from, from that perspective, it was ex extremely successful. And the whole thing really left us uh, really pleased, with, I think, with what we managed to do and keen to go and do it again, um, because there is actually probably much more surviving there than we thought there was at the beginning. Um, and we have learned more about it. We've learned more about the site, how to understand it. And um, I think we fulfilled what we set out to do. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>